From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And let me welcome you back to the Cannabis Podcast one more time. This is episode 118. Uh, 118. (laughs) If this is your first time joining us, well, an especially warm welcome for you. Ahead, we have 30 or 40 minutes of information about the plant we love, cannabis. Now, before we get too far, let me remind you, this program is intended only for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction and is intended purely for entertainment and perhaps educational purposes. You should always consume your cannabis responsibly. On episode 118, what do we have ahead for you today? A whole lot. We passed a billion dollars. A billion dollars in excise tax has been charged since 2018. A little story on that. We're going to touch on an opinion piece that appeared in the OkanaganZ.com from somebody who I connected with on LinkedIn as well. That's a really interesting story. Stick around for that. We have some news about the Cannabis Summit coming up in Kelowna in April. We know who one of the premier speakers is going to be. A little play on words there. (laughs) I have a story from my buddy down in the South, Ken, took me to a link from UBC in a study they have recently completed. Actually, I think it was a couple years ago they completed it. But they discovered how cannabis makes cannabinoids. That's pretty cool. And I have a story on tolerance breaks. Something that I've been thinking about, and and I'll touch on a little bit more in the story. So if you have been considering a tea break, maybe it's time for you to head down that path. we got a story on that as well. On Cultivar Corner, it is, in fact, not only the what we're doing on Cultivar Corner, it is, in fact, my inspiration for today. (laughs) 1964 Sour Cookies. 1964, a division of the folks at Simply Bear. And really nice weed coming out of there. And sour cookies, no exception to the rule. All of that and more on episode 118 of the Cannabis Podcast. And before we get too far along, as usual, let me thank you for being a listener. I also want to thank a couple of other special people. Tony. Tony has joined the community on Patreon. Thanks, Tony, along with Rob. Thanks for both being there. I appreciate it. Thanks to Kevin and Jordana, who connected through buymeacoffee.com. Always appreciate that. And I wanted to give a shout-out to all the hard-working cannabis reps who are listening. And I know there's a lot of you. (laughs) I appreciate you being here. I'm glad you and I can spend some time on the road together. And I want to send a similar shout-out to all the bud tenders across the country who are tuning in and suggesting the cannabis podcast to your guests as a good source for cannabis information and especially the cult of our corners. You know, together we are building a fabulous community centered on that precious cannabis plant that we so love, and we're doing it one token at a time. Thanks for being here. To our first story. And for that, we're going to mjbizdaily.com, where we have visited a lot, and a lot of the times we find the stories written by Matt Lamers. And guess what? Matt wrote this story as well. The Canadian government's cannabis duty surpasses $1 billion since 2018. The milestone comes as executives hope the government offers relief on the fee and excise regime it imposes on the industry amid mounting job and financial losses. According to the Canada Revenue Agency, the federal government assessed approximately $862 million in total duty on cannabis products between 2018 and 19 and 2021 fiscal years, most of which has been shared with provinces and territories. The CRA has yet to publish comparable figures for the 2021-22 financial year. But the most recent public amounts, which detail the government's expenses and revenues, show the federal government received revenue from the cannabis levy worth $160 million that year, bringing total duty since 2018 to a minimum of $1.02 billion. Yikes. (laughs) By product segment, dried fresh cannabis accounted for the lion's share of the duty assessed by the federal government. For the fiscal years covering the period 2018 to 21, Duty assessed on dried fresh cannabis made up 79.2% of the total. Cannabis extracts, including oil, accounted for 16.5% of the total duty. And duty applied to cannabis edibles did not start to meaningfully expand until the end of 2019-20 financial year when the products were rolled out across Canada. Now that is one of the things we are hoping to see some change in as they review the cannabis legislation. They've got to do something about the excise tax if this industry is going to survive. 
Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. This is the Cannabis Podcast. I recently made an association on LinkedIn, which is pretty good for connecting with people in the cannabis industry. If you haven't gone there or if you're not, if you're not on there yet, I'm finding it fairly successful for that. And the person who I connected with was Noah Shopsowitz. Noah contacted me, let me know that he had had some previous discussions with my friend David Wiley over at theokalogandz.com that fed him a couple of stories ideas. And guess what? Noah is the author of a special to the OZ in the latest version. And here is the story. This is from okanaganz.com. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. That's a quote from Howard Beale from the movie Network. In this article by Noah Shopswitz. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has effectively turned a billion dollars of positive cash flow in the legacy cannabis market into a billion dollars in losses, and on the way he's created another one billion dollars of unrecyclable garbage waste. I call this retrograde economics. Not bad for a PM who used to be a math teacher. He has accomplished this by not curating an intuitive business roadmap, but rather a counterintuitive one. What do I mean? For example, water always flows downhill. That's intuitive. Everybody knows that. To make water flow uphill is counterintuitive. The first hurdle that the PM created for Canadians is supply-side economics. It is a term governments like to use. It is lazy thinking. Understanding that there already was huge demand for cannabis, the Liberals only focused on how to create the buzz for legal weed. This drove his political green rush tactics and gave an illusion of prosperity and opportunity. No sound business roadmap was proposed, just promises that resonated at the polls. They drove Trudeau's success. What Canadians really did not understand is that his high school economic policy blocked the major pharmacy groups like Shoppers Drug Mart, London Drugs, and Rexall, which combined would have offered over 5,000 retail locations, seasoned supply chain management and finance. His government used Bill C-45 to kill the national chains, as it did not represent a large enough voting population. It was blatantly irresponsible, in my opinion, for the government of Canada to completely bullshit their citizens and put our economic well-being at risk. The years of job losses and hundreds of millions of dollars of losses is the result. Canopy growth has become the poster child of the PM's wayward thinking. Does anyone remember retired Senator Art Eggleton? once the chairman of the Standing Senate Committee on Social Affairs, Science, and Technology. He was the point person making recommendations to the government on the Cannabis Act. Eggleton is a very nice person and was previously the longest-running mayor of the city of Toronto. I had a brisk email exchange and some phone calls pre-legalization with him that ended badly. I asked Eggleton why the legislation was silent on sustainability of packaging. That was my business focus. Now, this is not a quote, but my impression is that the need to hurry up on the implementation of cannabis reform meant no time for innovation. In fact, no time to consider sustainability that could have been drafted into Bill C-45. What it also might have meant, now that I can see in retrospect, is that Canadian relations with China could be greatly improved as almost 100% of the packaging goods used for Canadian cannabis are sourced there. What does that mean? It means our good money is being sent to China. Not good for Canadians, but great for a government that would one day need to borrow back those dollars. Let's thank the PM for a few more gaffes. Originally, BC 45 pointed to the Consumer Packaging and Labeling Act, established in 1970, that was sufficient for every consumer good that was sold in Canada. It is suffice to say that the Act has adequately protected consumers. In the Act, labels are to be affixed to the packages. That would include shrink wrap labels that are widely in use. If a shrink wrap label is used, then it can be removed and disposed of. Today, there are an abundance of biodegradable shrink wraps available. Amendments to Bill C-45 have removed this opportunity for Canadians and replaced it with a law that requires labels to be stuck on with an adhesive. Often these adhesives are not recyclable. That makes the packaging not recyclable. Further, if there is a paper label stuck on a plastic package, then even if the plastic is recyclable, then the result will have black carbon specks when the paper is heated. This remade plastic may be good for railway ties or park benches, but surely it would never be suitable for consumer goods. That means that almost 100% of packaging used for cannabis in Canada is non-recyclable and must go into landfill. Way to go, Health Canada, in protecting Canadians. 
The only people being protected are themselves and the liberal government headed by Trudeau. And one last item. Why is cannabis not selling well at retail? That should be a logical question to ask these days, after canopy growth dumped Tokyo smoke, once the darling of Canadian cannabis retailing. Sorry to say retailing never fit the government's supply-side economic model, and the budget will balance itself? Who said that? Machiavellianism took control of the Canadian cannabis industry and threw all intuitive business methods out. It created the unsustainable economic and social reality we are experiencing today in the Canadian cannabis marketplace. And that article, written by Noah Shopsowitz, a graduate architect and Canadian business person chosen by the Liquor Control Board of Ontario over 400 other applicants to modernize their retail stores as manager of store design in the mid-1990s. Their team worked through many of the problems that face the Canadian cannabis marketplace today. Shopsowitz was mentored by the late Don Watt, the genius who created Loblaws and No Name. And thanks for that article, Noah. It raises a lot of good questions, and let's hope we can soon find some better answers. We've already told you about the 2023 Cannabis Conference that's happening here in Kelowna. Well, the Retail Cannabis Council of BC and BC Craft Farmers Co-op are excited to announce the first keynote speaker, for that 2023 BC Cannabis Summit. The Deputy Premier of British Columbia, the Honourable Mike Farnworth. He's also the Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General, and he will be in attendance. The second annual BC Cannabis Summit scheduled to take place April 21 to 23 on the traditional unceded territory of the Silix Okanagan people in Kelowna. We know Minister Farnworth understands the significant potential for BC's craft cannabis sector to generate thousands of clean, green jobs in all regions of the province, said BC CFC President Tara Kirkpatrick. We also know how excited the minister will be to hang out with the best craft cannabis farmers, processors, and independent retailers in the world. We hope many other BC sector leaders and elected officials will join us lakeside in Kelowna this spring. Looking forward to that, I have my ticket. If you're in the area and you're planning to attend, you should probably get your ticket soon. And of course, on the show page, I will put the link so you can check out the Cannabis Summit for yourself. And let me thank my buddy Ken from the South Okanagan who has sent me some weed and sent me lots of story ideas. Here's one link from Ken. This is from UBC Science, and I think Ken does a lot of reading. (laughs) He finds all of these fantastic studies. This one was from August of 2022, but I think still has relevance. Researchers have ID'd the high-efficiency hacks cannabis cells use to make cannabinoids. For the first time, plant biologists have defined the high-efficiency hacks that cannabis cells use to make cannabinoids, THC or CBD. Although many biotechnology companies are currently trying to engineer THC-CBD outside the plant in yeast or cell cultures, it is largely unknown how the plant does it naturally. This really helps us understand how the cells in cannabis trichomes can pump out massive quantities of tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, and terpenes, compounds that are toxic to the plant cells at high quantities without poisoning itself, says Dr. Sam Livingston, a botanist at the University of British Columbia who led the research. This new model can inform synthetic biology approaches for cannabinoid production in yeast, which is used routinely in biotechnology. Without these tricks, they'll never get efficient production. For centuries, humans have cultivated cannabis for the pharmacological properties that result from consuming its specialized metabolites, primarily CBD and terpenoids. Today, production within Canada's $2.6 billion a year cannabis industry largely relies on the biological activity of tiny cell clusters, called glandular trichomes, found mainly on the plant's flowers. The study reveals the macro-environments in which THC is produced and transported in cannabis trichomes and sheds light on several critical points in the pathway of making THC or CBD within the cell. Dr. Livingston and co-author Dr. Lacey Samuels used rapid freezing of cannabis glandular trichomes to immobilize the plant cellular structures and the metabolites in situ. This enabled them to investigate cannabis glandular trichomes using electron microscopes that revealed cell structure at the nano level showing that the metabolically active cells in cannabis form a supercell that acts as a tiny metabolic biofactory. Until now, synthetic biology approaches have focused on optimizing the enzymes responsible for making THC-CBD, like building a factory with the most efficient machinery to make as much product as possible. However, these approaches haven't developed an efficient way to move intermediate substances from one enzyme to another, or from inside the cell to the outside of the cell where final products can be collected. 
This research helps to define the subcellular shipping routes that cannabis uses to create an efficient pipeline from raw materials to end products without accumulating toxins or waste products. For more than 40 years, everything that we thought about cannabis cells was inaccurate because it was based on dated electron microscopy, says Dr. Samuels. This work defines how cannabis cells make their product. It's a paradigm shift after many years, producing a new view of cannabinoid production. This work has been challenging, partly the result of legal prohibition, and also due to the fact that no protocol for the genetic transformation of cannabis has been published. Well, thanks for the leak, Ken. I appreciate that, and thanks to the authors of the study at UBC, and especially the primary head of the who led the research, Dr. Sam Livingston, a botanist at the University of BC. And interesting, <laughs> this is the beauty of this plant, the you know, we 1964, Dr. Ralph Meshalom in Israel discovered the THC molecule, and here we are, 2023, and we may have figured out how that THC molecule is actually created in the little factory that does it, inside those wonderful little trichomes that we talk about all the time. And that's a pretty fascinating story. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me, cultivar corner. On Cultivar Corner today, we're heading back to the Fraser Valley. A division of the Simply Bear Company, which is owned by Rubicon, they have a number of different divisions. And today we're talking about 1964. Now, you may be asking, what's the relevance of 1964? Well, if you remember your history lessons... <laughs> 1964 was the year that a professor in Israel named Ralph Mishlom discovered the THC molecule. And here we are, what, almost 50 years later? <laughs> Actually, almost 60 years later. And we're still discovering things about THC that we wish we knew about. <laughs> That's where the impetus for the name of 1964 comes from. And let's give you a sense of what they do at 1964. The Cultural Revolution of the 60s broke down old-fashioned stereotypes and supplied a new vision for how people could live. In 1964, Professor Meshalom discovered the organic compound THC. Whilst it took nearly 60 years from its discovery to its legalization, the spirit of exploration has only grown stronger. And today, the spirit of 1964 is supplied by our team of pioneers who grow quality craft cannabis in the Fraser Valley of British Columbia. Now, the one disappointing factor of the 1964supplyco.com website, <laughs> there's nothing under products. <laughs> so I, I had to get the product information from other sources, which is always available. And in fact, the source that I picked this up from today was the OCS, out of Ontario, the Ontario Cannabis Store, and their selection for 1964 organic sour cookies. So let's tell you about this strain. This is a sativa-dominant, high-potency flower, derived from the well-loved GSC, or Girl Scout cookies, and sour diesel lineages. With beautiful bright purple leaves and glistening with crystal trichomes, its doughy yet sugary aroma is both sweet and sour, grown in living soil, hang-dried for 14 days, and cold-cured. Mmm, definitely that sugary aroma. Unusual. I'm, I'm often, when I pull out a... Sativa, I'm expecting to smell some of that limonene in there. There's no limonene indicated on this guy in terms of the dominant terpenes. The THC on this is at 70. No, it's not. <laughs> that would be amazing if the flower was at 70%. <laughs> Who knows? We may reach that point. But this flower is at 28.8% THC. And the total terps, 2.37% terps, which explains a little bit of the aroma that I'm getting out of the jar. And I took them out of the bag that they come in, and I immediately put them into one of my nice glass jars where I store my cannabis. Always better for it. Now, I've got one of the really nice big buds that came out of this grouping. Let's get out the jeweler's loop, and let's take a peek at that nice big bud and see what's a store for us. They say that there's some purple in here. Let me see if I can identify some purple. Yeah, there's some purple notes. Mmm, very frosty. I'm finding a lot of the weed that I look at through the jeweler's loop of late. I really got to dive deep into the structure to find the trichomes, but this one, they're just sitting right on top. Hmm. Very robust. 
lots of nice aromas coming out of that. Mostly some some fruitiness and yeah, fruitiness and a little bit of sweetiness. What's responsible for that? The terpenes inside of this are osamine at 0.73%, farnesine at 0.66%, and transcaryophylline at 0.20%. So there you go. That probably identifies why I've got the sweetness in there. Not only the osamine, but the farnesine. Nice big buds, really well cured. Uh, obviously hang dried, hand trimmed. Nice job on it. Firm structure on the buds. I noticed as I broke them up to create my joints and to get the vaporizer ready, that does generate a little bit more aroma as you break those buds up. Leaves a little bit on your fingers to <laughs> sniff throughout the rest of the day. <laughs> and that is enough explanation. Let's get down to giving a try to 1964 Organic Sour Cookies. Looking for a nice sativa today. That's what this is, sativa dominant. Got a lot of stuff to do, and I'm hoping that this is going to be my impetus. 1964, Organic Sour Cookies and the Joint. Always hoping that I get a smooth first hit off of every joint I pull, and luckily this is the case with this one. I mean, some of the stuff that we've been getting that perhaps is a little on the old side can create a little harshness as you bring that into your lungs. I'm just checking the package date on this guy. And I actually picked this up off of my Mendo. And the package date on this was October 5th, 2022. And I'm recording this on roughly the end of January, 2023. So that would be one, two, three, almost four months old. There wasn't a Bavita pack in the package. At least I don't remember there being one. There could have been one. Sometimes I forget about those. It was kept fairly fresh, though. Uh, not too dry. It does not crumble at my fingers. Mm. Nice and smooth. And here come the happy eyes. <laughs> I just love that. Oh, wow. Move over to the Crafty Plus, and we start to get some flavor on the sour cookies. Again, Girl Scout cookies and sour diesel is the lineage. Mmm. So much more taste. A little bit of those cookies, a little bit of the sour, some gassiness from the diesel. Really quite an, uh, an array of tastes that are coming off of that. And once again, I have to say, very smooth, especially off the crafty. Oh, yeah, now I'm getting some of those sweet notes. Maybe the farnesine and the osamine. Mm, mm, mm. THC, 28.8%. So in theory, this should be giving me a pretty good buzz. <sighs> You know that sound, don't you? That's the sound when Gary finally feels his happy eyes. <laughs> and that sense of euphoria has overtaken. Hoping to remain fairly euphoric for the next little bit. And that will have to be a discussion we have on the Cannabis Podcast sometime soon. Is a survey of how long your high lasts. Because I think there's varying links of, of the high for many people. And I know for me, it's really, really short. It could be the fact that I just smoke too much weed for, for, for this long and it just doesn't last very long. Now this year, there will be an opportunity to test that out because we are making a trip to Australia to see my daughter, her husband, and our new granddaughter. And since cannabis is not legal in Australia at the moment, I'm probably not going to be taking any with me. <laughs> well, let me be clear. I won't be taking any with me. I'm not stupid enough to try to bring anything through an international border at this stage. So that's going to be kind of a forced tea break for me. And I'll take records. I'll keep track of, of what's happening to me in that concept or in that context. And we'll likely discuss that on a future episode of the Cannabis Podcast. But I digress. 
In the interim, while I was thinking about that stuff, my furnace went for another run, <laughs> and that gave me an opportunity to finish that joint, to finish what was in the vaporizer, and have that sit for a bit. And I have to tell you, it sits really, really nice. The organic sour cookies, Girl Scout cookies, and sour diesel really giving me a nice headstone right now. Really in my head, lots of euphoria, lots of lots of energy, just feel like doing some stuff. And I have to say, I am so pleased that on the sativas, I don't get any of those anxiety issues or paranoia that I know a lot of people get. So happy that my endocannabinoid system doesn't dish me up any of those pieces. Really liking this one. Again, it's just rolling around in my brain now. Big happy eyes, big euphoria, lots of excitement and lots of energy for the day. I think this is going to be a good one. They're doing some good work down the Fraser Valley. 1964, the year THC was discovered. And the name of another cannabis company under the Simply Bear Rubicon umbrella and sour cookies, definitely leaving me very, very euphoric. Sharing stories about good weed while trying good weed. This is the Cannabis Podcast. For the next story, we're going to weedmaps.com. And this is a subject that has some personal meaning, as we'll talk about at the end of the story. What is a cannabis tolerance break? And when is it useful? A tolerance break, sometimes called a tea break, is a deliberate temporary cessation of cannabis consumption for the purpose of resetting the body's tolerance to THC. Anyone who regularly consumes either medical or recreational cannabis, or both, will develop higher and higher tolerances to THC. This tolerance can be reduced by taking tolerance breaks. Tolerance is when the body becomes resistant to the effects of a substance or medication that is taken regularly. With repeated consumption, more of the substance is needed to achieve the original desired effects. Like many other drugs and medicines, THC is consumed on a regular basis. Tolerance is a very complex phenomenon, and scientists don't fully understand the adaptations happening in our bodies when we experience it. However, brain imaging studies of people who use cannabis regularly have shown that chronic cannabis THC use causes a decrease in the number of THC receptors in the brain. The body's natural system that interacts with cannabis, our endocannabinoid system, is a very dynamic and responsive system. It's no surprise that the ECS senses when it is being overwhelmed by THC and compensates by becoming less sensitive. As a result, more THC, in the form of more frequent use or higher potency cannabis varieties, is required to achieve the same results you experienced when you first started consuming. While tolerance builds with continued regular use, research is inconclusive on how long it takes to develop. Animal studies have suggested that female rodents develop tolerance more rapidly than males, but this has been difficult to study in humans. The process is highly variable and depends on numerous factors such as consumption patterns, THC doses, routes of administration, and even genetic makeup. The universal standard is if you notice that you need to increase the amount of cannabis you're using in order to feel its effects, you've built up a tolerance. Is it bad to build up a tolerance? No, tolerance isn't necessarily a bad thing. Many medical patients wish to derive the benefits of THC for pain relief, for instance, but they have a hard time dealing with THC side effects of impairment and brain fog. Once a person develops a sufficient level of tolerance, it's possible to reap the medical benefits of cannabis in the absence of unwanted impairment. Anecdotally, patients have reported that when they first starting out on cannabis therapy, they have success taking THC right before bed. By sleeping through the intoxication for a week or two, they're slowly able to incorporate small amounts of THC into their daytime routine capturing medical benefits with minimal side effects. What are the benefits of a tolerance break? Tolerance breaks offer plentiful benefits with little effort. Moderating cannabis consumption by taking regular breaks is a good strategy for minimizing the risks of consuming too much THC. In the ECS, THC activates CB1 receptors in the brain's reward pathway, which triggers neurological responses that increase the likelihood a person will use cannabis again. While technically there's nothing wrong with the fact that cannabis is a rewarding substance that makes people feel good, anything that creates the feeling of reward can be abused. Too much regular consumption can increase the risk of developing cannabis use disorder, CUD, and cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, CHS. A tolerance break mitigates the risk of developing these disorders by disrupting the body's physical dependence on THC. Taking a tolerance break also increases the effectiveness of cannabis on the body once you resume consumption. This means you get a more potent high or more symptom relief from less weed, which means less money spent in the long run. What are the side effects of a tolerance break? Chronic users of cannabis may experience some withdrawal symptoms when attempting a tolerance break. One study showed that nearly half of consumers report withdrawal symptoms when quitting after regular long-time use. 
These symptoms are similar to nicotine withdrawal and include irritability, decreased appetite, depressed mood, restlessness, anxiety, and insomnia. These side effects are most likely to occur in highly dependent consumers, but cannabis withdrawal symptoms are typically mild and generally not disruptive. For medical patients, the symptoms that are being treated with cannabis are likely to return during a period of cannabis abstinence. Temporarily switching to another medication or using complementary and alternative therapies may be helpful during this time. Because medical patients are likely to be daily consumers of cannabis, they are particularly vulnerable to the risks of chronic cannabis use, such as hyperemesis. Managing tolerance is an important part of sustainable, long-term cannabis therapy. How do I take a tolerance break? To take a tolerance break, stop consuming cannabis for at least two days. Research demonstrates that CB1 receptor availability is diminished by chronic cannabis use. These receptors rapidly return to a cannabis naive state after a mere 48 hours of abstinence. That's to say your tolerance break should be back to normal after holding off from consuming for two days. Some people may find this difficult to do because they've come to rely on cannabis to make their daily lives more manageable or enjoyable. While cutting back the frequency or amount you consume, exercising moderation is never a bad thing. It's different than going cold turkey and taking a true tolerance break to reset the body's ECS. Some people may find it helpful to taper down their use over a period of time before taking a true tea break for a few days. Those who consume cannabis a few times per day may benefit from longer tolerance breaks of two weeks or even a month. However, the length of your tolerance break is entirely up to you. Determine what you want out of a tolerance break, give it a try, and see how your body feels. Everyone's body interacts with cannabis and THC differently, and there's no one-size-fits-all for tolerance breaks. How often should I take a tolerance break? Tolerance breaks have not been rigorously studied by doctors or scientists. However, some cannabis-centric physicians and patient advocacy groups have suggested that taking a 48-hour break every 30 days is a good strategy for managing tolerance and preventing physical dependence. Whether you are using cannabis to manage a chronic health condition or simply enjoy having it as part of your regular routine, there are good reasons to monitor and manage your intake to keep your endocannabinoid system functioning at its best. If you decide that it's time for a tolerance break, it might be helpful to let your friends and loved ones know. Ask your friends to support you and, with their help, Avoid situations that may challenge your commitment to a tolerance reset. And that's a story from WeedMaps.com and the relevance for me personally. <laughs> I am taking a trip to visit my daughter, her husband, and our brand new granddaughter in Australia this year. And guess what? Cannabis is not legal in Australia. <laughs> and I don't plan on taking anything across any international borders. So, Gary's going to have to have a tolerance break. And I'm thinking to be more sensible about it, I'm probably going to do a two to three week kind of thing because I'm away for two weeks there. So there's definitely two weeks. And I am, my plan is to kind of do it beforehand. I want to get through all of the nastiness of any, any of those side effects. I plan, I'm sure that I'm going to be a little bit irritable. I've often heard that there is a lack of appetite, which for me will be very, very weird. So it is coming up. I'm going to plan it, try to plan it around also this particular podcast. And there may be one this year that is produced where I am completely cannabis free. And that will be a different experience as well. So if you've been thinking about doing a tea break, maybe you want to do it along with me, or maybe you want to see how, how it works. I thought this story was good. That fact that 48 hours will give you a bit of a tolerance break. And that's probably something I'm going to try just in the initial phases of this and then move that into a longer, probably a three-week tolerance break, and then just imagine what my first cultivar corner is going to be like when I get back to smoking cannabis. That's going to be fun. And let's finish this episode with a rather surprising story that just dropped yesterday here in BC. <laughs> I'll give you the details as I read it. This is for, from 420intel.com. A British Columbia cannabis company says it has approval from Health Canada to include cocaine as a substance the company can legally possess, produce, sell, and distribute. Adastra Labs in Langley said it has been granted an amendment to its dealer license to interact with up to 250 grams of cocaine, nearly 9 ounces, to import cocoa leaves to manufacture and synthesize the substance. It said it received its approval from Health Canada on February 17th. Harm reduction is a critically important and mainstream topic, and we are staying at the forefront of drug regulations across the board, Adastra CEO Michael Forbes said in a release. We proactively pursued the amendment to our dealer's license to include cocaine back in December 2022. 
We will evaluate how the commercialization of this substance fits with our business model at Adastra in an effort to position ourselves to support the demand for a safe supply of cocaine. Forbes said he has extensive experience working on the front lines of addiction medicine, as he was previously a pharmacist at multiple methadone pharmacies. He also piloted a needle exchange program at the direction of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention around a decade ago. The company said it also is allowed to possess, produce, sell, and distribute up to 35 ounces of psilocybin and psilocin. On Thursday, Global News asked PC Premier David Eby for his thoughts on Health Canada's decision to make the amendment for the langley Bay's lab. Eby was shocked to hear the news. The short answer is that I was astonished by this announcement, Eby said. I understand that this company has indicated Health Canada has given them some kind of authorization. It's not part of our provincial plan. If Health Canada did in fact do this, they did it not only without engaging with the province, but they did it without notice to us. We will get answers for British Columbians about this. This is not part of our initiative, and we'll make sure British Columbians get the answers they deserve about this. BC Liberal leader Kevin Falcon spoke about the Health Canada decision on Thursday. Thursday, we had a very important discussion that should worry British Columbians, and that is a company issued a press release about how excited they are for the commercialization of the sale of cocaine in BC. Falcon said during media availability. As we've said from the beginning, the decriminalization program that the NDP is rushing headlong into, our comment is that there is effective decriminalization for amounts of 2.5 grams or less, which the police chief told me, and I agree. But the guardrails put in place by the federal government were spelled out really clearly. The BC NDP has not fulfilled any of the requirements. Adastro was not available for an interview Thursday. And I have to say, I heard this news as I was dra- driving back from an appointment on uh, just yesterday. <laughs> and my wife had mentioned something that she had heard about it the day before. And I thought, no way. There's no way that Health Canada is going to grant anybody a license to sell cocaine. Well, apparently, I was wrong. There is a surprise around every corner. What do you think about that? Do you think that's something that Health Canada should be pursuing? I know in BC, we had decriminalized small amounts of other drugs, but... To combine cocaine with a cannabis company? I'm not sure I get the connection. It is not very often that I have to come back and do an update to a story before I actually publish the podcast. (laughs) This is such an example. You just heard me talk about a company being allocated a license by Health Canada to do cocaine and cannabis. (laughs) Apparently, they jumped the gun a little bit. And there was not only one, but there was actually two companies that came out yesterday and said that they had been granted such a license. And boy, did it create a controversy. (laughs) Here is a story from the Vancouver Sun. BC Company Issues Retraction After Backlash Over Cocaine Commercialization Plan This comes as a second BC company says it is now licensed to produce, sell, and distribute cocaine, as well as opium and MDMA, also known as ecstasy. A BC company that recently announced it was one of the first in Canada to obtain a federal permit to sell and distribute cocaine retracted its remarks on Friday. A statement on Adastra Labs' website says it is not currently undertaking any activities with cocaine under the dealer's license and will only do so after consulting the province. The clarification comes after backlash from senior government leaders including Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Premier David Eby. Trudeau said Friday that Ottawa was working very quickly with the Langley-based company to correct the misunderstanding caused by its statement, which appeared to disclose it was looking to commercializing cocaine as part of its business model. The statement comes a month after B.C. became the first Canadian province to decriminalize adult possession of up to 2.5 grams of cocaine, opioids, amphetamines, and ecstasy in a three-year pilot project. E.B. criticized the cannabis company's release of information, telling reporters Friday it significantly misrepresented the nature of the license. The Premier also said he was astonished to learn Health Canada had granted Adastra the license to produce cocaine in the first place. The B.C. government has not been engaged at all by Health Canada, let alone notified that this had happened. Health Canada says while Adastra Labs is allowed to produce cocaine with the license, it is for scientific and medical purposes only. If the strict requirements are not being followed, Health Canada will not hesitate to take action, which may include revoking the license. The first BC company to be granted a federal license to produce cocaine, Victoria's Sunshine Earth Labs, said it has hopes it will be able to assist medical professionals and researchers who seek to expand the scope of the strategy. We defer to specialists in this area to determine the specifics of how this could be implemented and do not engage in promoting or launching safer supply initiatives, Sunshine Labs told Post Media in a statement on Friday. When asked if he thinks government policy should evolve to allow companies to sell cocaine to the public, Eby told reporters Friday, 
No, I don't. The core idea of decriminalization of people facing addiction is that when they are using street drugs, that they may have had a chance to go and test those drugs before they use them, without worry they would be arrested, said the Premier. Arresting them, putting them in jail, running them through a trial is not going to deal with the issue. Getting them in touch with medical health professionals is. So there you go. A very quick backlash after the announcement last week about Adastra having a license to be able to produce cocaine along with cannabis. And as it turns out, that statement caused a lot of controversy. Once more, thank you so much for being a listener of the podcast. If you ever have a comment on anything you hear on the Cannabis Podcast, please send a note to info at CannabisPodcast.com. If you would like to support the podcast in other ways, there are a couple of paths you can take. You can go to buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast, and if you feel so inclined, you're welcome to buy me a doobie. Or you can become a patron on Patreon, like Tony and Rob. The links are at the top right on the show page, or you can find it at cannabispodcast.com as well. Thank you so much for being here. That's it for episode 118 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Hey there, this is Cheryl Murray Powell Esquire, and I'm the host of the Terps in the City podcast. I am a cannabis agricultural dietary supplement and trade attorney. I'm also a hemp farmer, and I've been recently named to the list of High Times Magazine's top 100 influencers in cannabis. I'm inviting you to follow me along my journey as I move back to New York to support the adult use market there. You're going to get a chance to listen to conversations with some of my friends along the way. I look forward to seeing you at Terps in the City.